I think one of the most powerful things in humanity, and you can see it in, in most literature and movies, and there's redemption, right? There's great redemption out there. So I want everyone out there that thinks that they're not good enough or they've done bad things or the, the, all this stuff, there's always room for redemption. John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for being here. How are you? I'm doing good, Jimmy. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm excited to speak with you because I think you have a very interesting story, right? Um, you had a spiritual transformation or awakening, I should say, while being a soldier in Baghdad. So I, I want to just jump right into your story. What made you join the army and what sparked your spiritual awakening or transformation while being in the army? Right. I well, I joined the army straight out of high school, and you know, I joined about a year before nine eleven. So by the time I got done with training and everything, I was uh, it was only about six months before the war started, and then the war started. I spent half of my enlistment in Kuwait, and uh, about two and a half years, and I was there for you know supporting our troops in Afghanistan. We invaded Iraq from Kuwait as well. And it, once my my enlistment was over, I had to decide if I was going to kind of stay in or get out or go back and to the, you know, I was a counterintelligence special agent. So I could have gone back to Washington, D.C. and worked in the Beltway, but I, I didn't I didn't want to work in a cubicle and fight traffic twice a day and all that. So I my wife, who was did a similar job to me, we decided to stay doing what we were doing. We did it as civilians. So once we got out of the Army, we were civilians basically just doing the same job and uh, we did go to Baghdad for over a year and a half, and uh, I didn't have my spiritual awakening then. It, I We came home from Iraq. I, then we would have spent about six and a half years in Afghanistan and Kandahar. And it was, it was after those kind of 15 years on and off being in combat zones, coming back home. And I ended up like kind of like lost for about seven years when we came home. And then after those seven years, I kind of, I had this moment or spiritual moment of clarity, understanding, awakening. We call it different things, right? And when I was doing research and I was reading through some of your stuff, I I, I thought you had had like some sort of reckoning or knowing while being stuck in a desert. Do I have that correct? Yeah. Yeah. I I I gained a lot of perspective in combat. Uh, I, you know, having missiles shot at you and, and truck bombs go off and rockets shot, you know, like I, and also like I was part of this military industrial complex. That's kind of this dark machine. Like it does some good stuff. Don't get me wrong. We, it's, there's some good things for this, that, and the other, but there's still a dark machine at times. And so being part of that darkness and like you're fighting the quote unquote enemy and the longer you're fighting, the more you realize we're all just humans. And so I definitely had a reckoning in that I I discovered that in my time in all these deserts in in Kuwait and Iraq and Afghanistan that we're all just human and we're all just trying to make it in the world and that really kind of struck me. I didn't realize at the time I was that this was a spiritual thing necessarily, but it was a powerful thing that happened to me that I I think would definitely lead to that awakening later on for sure. Yeah. And how would you describe your spiritual awakening or, you know, your spiritual awareness? Because you hear people say that all the time, like, I had an awakening, I had a, a knowing, and I woke up. But a lot of times I want to know, like, what did you wake up to, right? Like, who were you before yeah. the spiritual awakening or the knowing? And what did you wake up to or realize after, you know, the spiritual awakening? That's a great question especially the before and after part, you know, before I wasn't, I think we're all on a journey, whether we know it or not. I didn't know that at the time. So I didn't know I was on a journey, right? Um, I was on a spiritual path. I wasn't religious. I wasn't overtly spiritual. Uh, I was just, you know, uh, I was, I was kind of, I was, I was wounded and still trying to figure out all those years later, how to keep healing from war and, and move on from that. And, uh, figure out my place in the world and all that. And then when the my moment happened, it was kind of like a bolt of lightning that happened late at night. I was laying in bed. My wife was asleep. And 
I just had this understanding of oneness, of like the oneness of the universe that we're all connected. It's a very pantheistic idea that um, essentially we're two, we're, we're like you and I are two parts of the same whole. And that uh, it was a very loving kindness kind of uh, understanding. I understood what my higher purpose or my Dharma was. My higher purpose was to help people help themselves and find their wholeness, whether they knew they were whole inside or not, find that light. And I knew I wanted to create a place where people could come together and have those conversations, regardless of their spiritual belief or their religious belief, that we could all have different beliefs, but we're kind of saying the same thing, and that we could all talk about it in a better way. So that that kind of all came to me like all at once. So what are some of your spiritual beliefs? I am I call myself an omnist or a universalist, and what that basically means overall is that I believe in the validity of all religions, spiritual philosophies, whatever, self-help development, you know, even atheists, whatever. Now, within that, I personally have a lot of appreciation for Hinduism, uh, uh, elements of, of the Tao and Taoism, some certain pagan and indigenous uh, traditions that I don't practice, or, you know, specifically, but help inform my own practice. Uh, so it's kind of like, I try to read a lot of different stuff from around the world and across time and figure out what resonates with me and what works for me. Uh, and and since we're all saying very similar things, what speaks to me in the, the easiest to understand way that makes the most sense for me to practice every day? Yeah, that makes sense. You know, when I was reading through your, your bio and you said that you were an ominous and I was like, oh, what is that? And I look it up. And it was just kind of someone, like you said, who kind of believes in the validity of, you know, all religions. And I would say like, oh, I think that's me too, to some extent, right? I think for me, um, like I know you mentioned, you know, atheism and I and I see where atheists come from, um, but I just, I there's just something in within me, irrevocable irrevocably that believes in a God, right? But I yeah. see why someone could find themselves be like being an atheist. So when you said that, I was like, oh, like that sounds kind of similar to how I think about a lot of things. I grew up Christian. Um, I still very much, if I had to identify with a religion, it would definitely be Christianity would be the religion that I identify with because that's the religion I grew up in. But I don't necessarily think that Christianity uh, trumps other religions or or practices. And you you talked about like paganism and stuff like that. So I want to dig a little bit deeper into that. So are you of the mindset in a monotheistic God or you are open to polytheism or you you understand the reason certain religions have polytheistic models versus others? I'm just curious. No, that's a good question. Uh, I like talking about this. This is a good, it's a good conversation. I, for me, I call myself. I would probably classify myself as a pantheist from that perspective, as far as what the deity is, because I believe the I believe I am the universe, and the universe is me, right? So, uh, that everything is all one part of the divine. That that the divine is just all of us. It's everything. It's nature. It's it's us humans. It's rocks. It's it's plants it's all that and i see that even though people would call that pantheism i see it i think you could call it almost monotheism because it's just one entity you know but as in as but if you're a monotheist i i can get behind that because i think it, we're saying very similar things but also polytheism you know i i if you look at different traditions around the world it's like almost like polytheism is just a, a mechanism of ritual to connect with the divine and it's not like they're worshiping that specific God, you know, just, but it's almost like it's, that's just the connection to something beyond from a ritualistic perspective. So I'm not a polytheist, but I get it. And I think that sometimes we get a little bit too literal when, when we classify that as polytheism uh, and we're kind of misunderstanding that that's just that, that person's connection to the other side, you know? Okay. So I think I'm understanding what you're saying that it kind of serves as an intermediary, right? Like something yeah. that is uh, something or an entity that serves as kind of, I don't want to say a translator, but I think the best analogy I can think of is 
when people within Christianity, for example, call on the Holy Spirit, right? Um, yeah. People consider the Holy Spirit as a part of God, right? Like we have right. the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're all parts of God. So I think what you're trying to say is that in certain religions, that could be like with certain entities that they quote unquote pray to, or they might ask them to be intercessors to the alt, like the one God, the one yeah. being the one entity. That's a, that's a interesting, that's a good way of like looking at it, I, I believe. Right. Okay. So um, I, again, I just want to like push a little bit further, right? Because sure, you yeah, did absolutely. work in, you know, you, you worked with the government, you were in the army mm -hmm. and, you know, there's so much talk about like, you know, violence and all these conspiracy theories about like the new world order and control and domination. And, you know, I think some people even say like, if you're someone who believes in aliens, I don't know if you do, but this like the reptilians like having a lot of their hands within the army and stuff. So I want to know as someone who's, you know, been in it, you were immersed in it for a couple of decades. Do you add this, these concepts or think about these things when you think about the larger uh, purpose of life or, you know, how we relate with one another, et cetera? Uh, that's, that's a fun question. Uh, yeah. I like that. That's really fun. I, I do believe in aliens. I, in general, like I, I, I definitely believe that there's stuff out there that we're not the only thing in the universe. Like it's so big. Uh, so yeah, I do believe in that. I, I, I also think, I think that it's possible that yes, we've had contact with aliens and the, and the government is, is covering it up. I think that the government has some limited capability to keep something like that a secret for a long time. It, it, like a big, big secret like that as a whole, like, the government's really bad at conspiracies. Like it's the federal government is this the in the 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 Department of Defense and all this. It's very tribalistic. It's very feudal. And so there's no one person in charge of everything. It's not Congress. It's not the president. It's not the Supreme. You know, there's it's it's organized chaos, the government is. And so in order to carry out a conspiracy. It has to be, it would have to be something super serious, like aliens, or, you know, it would have to be something super, you know, super small amount of people that are aware of it, you know, like, but as a whole, I don't subscribe to a lot of conspiracy theories because the federal government's just too messed up to make that happen. <laughs> so. That's interesting that you say that, because I feel like I've, I've heard, um, you know, people who have, you know, worked similar, done work similar to you, um, like have the like opposite thought on yeah. on this and they're very much down rabbit holes with um uh, different conspiracy theories so i just had to ask like yeah. where you I were mean, at in that conversation i don't talk about it very often but i mean i had a top secret security clearance and i was you know i was counterintelligence and i mean i know people who've worked at uh like groom lake area 51 i know people who've worked there mm -hmm. and like my uh one of my counterintelligence partners in kuwait uh, years ago, 20 years ago, was his name was Lu Luis Elizondo or Luis Elizondo. He's one of the guys that was in the Department of Defense that came out about aliens. Uh, I know Lou quite well. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, it's it's an interesting thing to talk about. Yeah, it is very interesting. And another question I have for you related to war, um, you know, when people like have a spiritual awakening and they have this notion like we're all one, like you're me, I'm you and all of that stuff, you know, you start to see, you don't see as much of a divide between you and someone else who might not look like you, right? So do you have any thoughts on the purpose of war? Do you still think that war and combat is necessary? And if you do or if you don't, how do you kind of like reconcile that with your experience? That's a complicated question. And so I'll answer it the best that I can. Uh, I will say that in the world that we live in right now, like sitting here today, combat is necessary. War is, you know, a, an army, a standing army is necessary where humanity is at. I will also, at the same time, I will tell you that I was idealistic growing up. I wanted to do counterterrorism and I wanted to go figure that out and make the world a better place and help the world. That's one reason I joined the army. And the longer I was in the machine, the less 
I saw myself helping the world. And the more I, I realized that war is ultimately political. War is a political tool. It's a political device. And it doesn't matter why you go to war after the first 48, 72 hours or whatever, right? It's just, there's going to be, there's not, the reason you went to war isn't going to be the reason you stay at war. And, 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 and I mean, you know, we were at, we, we were in Afghanistan for 20 years. That's politics. Um, you know, we invaded Iraq, not because Saddam was a threat to us or because he was involved in 9-11. We, we invaded Iraq because of politics um, or because Saddam tried to kill W's dad, you know, tried to assassinate him back in 93, you know, whatever. And, I, and I'm out of politics now. I'm very apolitical. I'm, I'm comfortable talking about it a little bit, but uh, to be able to answer questions like that, because I was I was involved in geopolitics for my job and I had to know it and and. Uh, but war is political. It doesn't serve much of a purpose. Uh, I think we do have to have a strong and present military because of the we can't get each we can't get each other to just accept one another and to regard each other as humans instead of regarding each other as people that are part of a nation with like imaginary invisible borders that don't really exist. I think you know it's that. If you if everybody could just go back to that, you know, we are the world, right? You know, and Michael Jackson and the the song, and you know, we're all one, right? Uh, but we can't. So at, at this point, it, it, it war is pointless. It doesn't serve much of a purpose, and yet we still have to have a military. I guess that's the best I can answer that. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, you're saying obviously, you know war is pointless it'd be nice if we could all just kumbaya and like hug and hold each other's hands but that's not the case we're still going to have to have a system of protection um and unfortunately in this reality that we're living in there's certain things that we need to i guess fight for or be able to stand up against and related and related to like geopolitics etc even though a lot of it is very dicey and questionable yeah that's a good summary and i would add at the end of that that i'm I, i'm completely out of politics now i i'm out of even social justice i'm about self-love and loving my neighbor mm -hmm. because i think that's the best way that i can change the world is not through any political action or social justice or politics i the best thing I can do for the world is to love my neighbor, regardless of who they are, or what they are, and to love myself. And that can lift up and change the world. I would add that in because I think that's an important uh, asterisk or qualifier to that. Okay. Yeah. And I think that makes sense. And one one thing you talked about is um, the importance of living your higher purpose or dharma. What What is dharma? Dharma. I hear that a lot. What is it and why is that important to like achieve or, or reach? I I talk about it from kind of the Hindu sense of Dharma. Mm -hmm. And it, it it basically it roughly translates into what your higher purpose is in this world, like what you as an individual are meant to do. Uh and I think that that's gonna change for each person. It's gonna change within that person, that might change in, in throughout their life. It might be something and it might change into something else. And I think some some of us kind of have an essence of what we're put on the earth to do, on the world, in this universe to do. Some of us kind of know that. Some of us might just have an essence, but not quite know it. And some of us might not even think about it or realize it. And I, I feel like if we're not living our higher purpose, if we don't know what it is, we have to find out. And if once we find out, if we're not aligning that with how we live our life, with how we uh, live our day to day, with, with the, the job that we have, I think we're setting ourselves up for like a lot of heartache and, and pain and suffering. Essentially, it sounds like living in the uh, in a life that is intended for you, right? So yes, like being yeah. authentic and living in your higher purpose, because that word purpose is so heavy for a lot of people. And depending yeah. on what stage you are in life, it could, you know, change and like kind of yeah. look different. So it's always kind of like, how how can you tell when you're living in your dharma? Like, how do you know when you're living in your higher purpose? That's a good question too, uh, and I get asked. I get asked that a lot <laughs> uh, by 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 hosts sometimes, and by by clients as well, by by people that I talk to. It it's going to be different for each person to realize what they're if they're living it. You kind of have to ask yourself, okay, like what lights my brain up? Like what lights me up? What makes me lighter? 
Like, what's that thing that I'm going to do tomorrow that I can't wait to go to sleep and wake up and do it again? Uh, and maybe you have an essence of that, not you, but the, like the big you and, and maybe someone else, you can even talk to other people and say, what do you think I love? Like what, what lights, do you know what lights me up? Like there's different ways to find it, to know, to, to, to then understand whether you're living it or not. Like what brings you joy and calm and peace and serenity? Those are answers to those questions. Are you and like, what are your values and beliefs? Cause some people can list their values and beliefs out. Some might not be able to tell you right away what their values and beliefs are. So are, are you in alignment with those? I think that's going to inform what your higher purpose is as well. Yeah, I agree with you. I think, you know, a lot of people say that, like, what lights you up? What can you do that, you know, fills up your spirit and everything? And I think because we live in a world that is so you, whatever your talent is, whatever you feel good about, you need to turn it into something that you can monetize. It can't just be something that you're just good at and that you enjoy. It has to be something that you like turn into, you know, um, money or you monetize it. But I'm starting to think about it differently. I think when you're living in your higher purpose and it's bringing you joy and it's bringing other people joy or you're doing it so that other people can benefit from it, then you know that you're living in your higher purpose. And again, like I think it could be a couple of different things for people, but I feel like if you're using that and sharing it with the world, whether you're monetizing from it or not, like uh, somebody who likes, you know, um, putting together or growing a garden, right? Like you're growing a garden, people walk past, you know, the flowers as they're blooming, et cetera. That probably puts a smile on their face and you don't even know the impact that you're making with kind of like building that garden and, and sharing it with the world as an example. That's a beautiful way to describe it. That no, you nailed it because okay. yeah, it, sometimes you're living it as your job or vocation, and sometimes it's just something that you do every day. And yeah, and and yeah, you're doing it for you, and yet you're lifting up the whole world around you. And you're when you're in line with your higher purpose, yeah, you're everyone around you going to be better because you're you're better. So everyone around you gonna is going to be you know your your spouse, your children, your coworkers, or whoever it is like. No, I totally agree that sometimes it is your occupation and sometimes it's just these things that you do in your life every day that align with with what you feel your purpose is. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, something else that you talk about is this notion of a stream of unconsciousness. What is the stream of unconsciousness? Because people talk about consciousness often, you know, being self-aware, understanding what's going on around you and how you're interacting with your reality. But what what is the stream of unconsciousness? That's an interesting term. Yeah, this I, I call it that because it's almost the opposite of what you're talking about. It's the when you're pulled by society to like do this or don't do that, or you've got to go to this school or, and you can't, you know, get married at this age and have kids, or whatever it is, get this job. You know, there's all this stuff we're told from a very young age by all these different people from our parents, our teachers, our our friends, our coworkers, where, that we have to do or do or can't do, right? So outside of all that noise, like who are who are we? And so that stream of unconsciousness is that thing that pulls us. It's like that conveyor belt of life that pulls us downstream. It can be kind of warm sometimes, it can be comfortable, but it's not necessarily fully acknowledging who and what we are or, or what's around us. If we just take a step uh, and stop and slow down and we we stand up we can look around and say oh i'm 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 outside of the stream of unconsciousness i see all this beauty around me i can see all this 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 life this uh now i understand who i am and what what i believe not what someone's telling me i should believe so it's it's about kind of yeah waking up like you were talking about being conscious being intentional being aware being all these things that sound like they're a lot of work but actually when you do them make you even it's easy. It becomes easier. It makes life easier. The word that I'm starting to really dislike a lot is have to. You have to. You have to do <laughs> yes. this. You have to do Agreed. that. And I'm disliking it more and more because I'm realizing how much of my decisions in life have come from, oh, I have to do this. This is the next step I have to take. Right. right. And just feeling like I didn't have an option but to do that. And I've, I'm finding that the more I'm my authentic self, the more I'm kind of learning to be conscious of myself, um, 
the better I am and the more real and, and honest I am, the less angry that I am. And I feel like a lot of people in the world are angry because they've had to live a life that they thought they had to live in a specific way. So yes. I really like that, you know, the stream of unconsciousness, it, it kind of, it, it's, it's kind of calling out the fact that, Hey, if you're not careful, you're going to end up just like, you know, I guess floating through life, like you're doing stuff, but it's not the stuff you want to do. You're not actually right. living your yeah. truth. Yeah. It's like we're living someone else's story instead of writing our own story. Right? Yeah. 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 And like, that's the purpose of, life it's so scary to think about though because i think we are people who like community and sometimes when you think different to what everybody thinks or you move different to how everybody um moves it can be very like ostracizing but i do think we're fortunate to live at a time or live in a time where we do have a lot more choice i think you know a couple hundred years ago i think we don't have the same choices that we have now because we were worried about where our next meal was coming from or, you know, there's so many other things that now in, you know, present day technology and just a lot of advancements kind of take care of. Um, and the quality of life has improved and a lot more people are empowered, especially women. Um, they can, you know, make their own money yeah. and stuff. So I do think we are living in a very opportune time to be able to have these conversations about, living a life that's more authentically aligned with who you are. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that you talk about the fact that we have all these opportunities now. And I love when people talk about like this optimistic take on humanity and where we're at and where, where we were, like you said, like a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, three, you know, we've come so far and there's all this beautiful, great, joyful things out there, but we get focused on that negative stuff, but there's all this cool stuff like that uh, our in abundance around us, we just kind of have to see it and go and go take it because it's there. You know, no one's going to give it to us. And I don't mean that in like a, a violent sort of way, right? We just have to go take it. The universe is offering it to us. We have to go stand up and, and reach out to the universe and say, I accept this. Speaking of the universe, you say that it's important to open up to the universe. What does opening up to the universe mean? And like, what does that mean to you? And what is the benefit? in opening up to the universe? The universe, it takes care of us. Like it will, it will send us what we need. It, often it's not going to look like what we asked for or what we thought we needed. And so if we're open to the universe, we're kind of in this mode of receiving and we can be on the lookout for opportunities that we didn't anticipate, didn't expect. And that if we're not, if we're not conscious of, then we're going to miss, uh, because the universe wants to help us. The universe wants us to to be taken care of. Uh, and there's a great balance in the universe. So if we just trust it and kind of, and, and we can't, we can't stay still. We have to be in motion. I don't believe in absolutes really. And I don't say you have to do this very often because like we were talking about earlier, I don't like those have tos, right? But the only constant in the universe is probably change. So what we should probably do is move with the universe because that's change, accept change and be in the rhythm of the universe, dance with the universe. So that's being open, being ready, being, being in receive mode. Yeah, I agree with you. I think when we're open to how the universe is guiding us, you know, people, it, it's so many different words, universe, source, God, however you want to yeah, describe I, it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I see it as the same thing. So yes. I, synonyms, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I find that when I'm open to the universe, you know, it gives us like whispers, nudges, signs like, hey, go in this direction. You know, you're you're making a wrong turn here. Like there's there's this willingness to kind of help us, because I guess the one of the biggest questions I have and a lot of people have is like, why do so many people suffer? Like, why come to this earth and choose to go through all these like trials and tribulations and deal with all of these things? Like, what is the purpose of this all, of all of all of this? And I think it, it's a little bit easier when we listen to those nudges and, you know, from the universe, we might not have the answer, but life gets a little bit easier for us when yeah. we listen to that. Yeah, you talk about those little nudges. And for me, it, you know, intuition, 
that gut intuition base feeling that we have that we know isn't our mind talking it's something different that that's the universe right that's god the divine the self you know whatever you want to call it that's telling us do this or don't do that or you shouldn't do this or you need you know that's the universe telling us something. that's not the society or someone else that's our that's our self our base inner self telling us something that is this deeply powerful thing that nudge that you're talking about you know, you talked about, you know, you're you're an ominist, uh, of course, but you said that some of the religions that you kind of, you know, really resonate with the most, like, you know, Hinduism, Taoism. And I know in Hinduism, th that was the first religion that I studied that really talked about the notion of karma and um, reincarnation and all that sort. So I just want to know, like, how, how deep are you in some of these uh you know, teachings, understandings, do you believe in them as well? And how does that play into your, you know, spiritual life and your connection with the divine and yourself? Yeah. I love that. It's a fun question too. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did, I delve deep, pretty deep into Hinduism. I, I believe in the universal oneness when I call it like the Brahmin, the universal thing, like the individualistic gods, like Krishna and stuff like that. I don't really get too deep into the individual personal gods of Hinduism, but the universal side of it, I do. Uh, some of the yogic traditions and uh, uh, really resonate with me. <clears throat> There's they they have an idea of that, you know, birth, life, death, re rebirth, that uh, you know, reincarnation, the, the cycle of things where you you come to life, you learn, you know, you die, you come back, you learn even more, and you know, you you advance, you evolve uh, as a being. And we talk about having old souls, you know. People are old souls or whatever, right? They've lived previous lives or seen other things, right? Uh, so they call that samsara, like it's a cycle, it's a circle that we're in. And I, 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 I deeply subscribe to that. I think that even within life, we have these cycles that we live that are smaller samsara. There's like, you know, we get stuck in these cycles of these habits and routines of positivity, of negativity, of things that affect us. And so, yeah, I, I, and like yoga isn't. Yoga isn't just a bunch of poses, right? It's a deeply, it's this meditative thing. It's it's this getting in touch with the 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 self inside that's tied to the universal everything, and that the poses and the breath work and everything just are a means to an end to achieve that spiritual connection to the other side, or to ourself, however you look at it, to the divine. So. Yeah, I, I definitely really, I really dig Hinduism. I think it's a really beautiful religion. I'm I'm really fascinated by Hinduism as well. I think reincarnation was like the first thing I heard and the whole karmic cycle that like, you know, got my attention. And I was like, I feel like that sounds pretty, that sounds right. I felt that in my gut. And of course, I've had so many conversations about it now, done additional research and it seems to track with a lot of uh, things that have been said and written about across like ancient um, yeah. civilizations, a lot of ancient history on the the, the notion of reincarnation and uh, karmic cycles, karmic laws, et cetera. And the reason I asked that question is because, I mean, it kind of gives you a different perspective on, again, why are we here? What is the definition of purpose? You know, even the relationships that we have in our life, you know, why are they here? You know, how we're interacting with the people in our lives. What does that really mean for our purpose in our life and our understanding of ourselves and the divine? So I thought it was important to, you know, obviously ask you that question. Um, I know that you you have a spiritual community called the Kisher Spiritual Community. So I just want to talk about that a little bit more. Um, what is the origin of the name and like, why did you decide to create this community? Thank you for asking. Uh, it's been kind of my, my labor of love for over two, two and a half years now. So uh, I knew that I wanted to create a nonprofit online spiritual community as soon as almost I had my awakening. It was like almost simultaneous. And I, I felt like there was room in this modern age for authentic, meaningful connection in the digital world. Looks like you and I are having a great conversation right now. We can do that, right? Uh, I want a place where people could uh, tell their story, hear other people's stories, you know, where there are affirmations and meditations and courses. And um, so I, you know, we we needed a name and Kishar is the Sumerian goddess of Mother Earth or Gaia. And I thought that kind of uh, was a beautiful thing, the divine, divine feminine as well. And 
it also represents the line on the horizon between earth and sky. And I think that line on the horizon really encapsulates that journey that we're all on, which is pretty cool. And so that's the name. And my wife and I co-founded it with another friend of ours that we met in Afghanistan who grew up in the Balkans at war. And then she was doing stuff with us in Afghanistan. And and so we're the three co-founders of the nonprofit and um, trying to get back to the world, you know, trying to create a place where people can come be members and find um, what's empowered for them. We're not going to tell you what your spirituality is. We're not going to tell you what your belief is. It's like, we're going to give you options and say, here's what's out here. You decide. Um, and it doesn't matter if you're Hindu or Christian or a, a new age spiritualist, we can all hang out together and uh, have meaningful discussions, but in, have fun, have have Zoom roundtables and uh, all that kind of stuff. So yeah, it's it's a it's been like I said, a labor of love. I love what you said that you know you're not trying to create a community where you're kind of telling people what to believe. You're kind of presenting them with knowledge, creating a space where it doesn't matter what your belief. Um, your creed, whatever, we can just kind of all come together in in union and have conversation and have like a safe space. And it's interesting. And the reason why I really like that you said that is because a lot of the stuff online is very polarizing. I think everyone is so like, this is my camp. This is my belief. Like, it's not going to change. If you don't believe this, then I don't, this is crazy. Like, there's just so much divide a lot of times, you know, within the spiritual community. And I'm of the belief that, um, you know, a lot of, like you said, with the whole ominist idea is that they're like, there's a overlying or like an underlying truth in a lot of these religions, right? And as human beings, we all have different interpretations. Some people kind of like interpret it in a more negative way. Other people interpret it in a more yeah. loving way. And, you know, but at the end of the core of all religions is like this idea of like oneness and and love, right? So I love that you're creating a community for people to just like be themselves, no matter what, you know, we don't, it doesn't have to be like, oh, this is what we believe. It's like, yeah, like we're going to have these discussions. These are the options presented to you. You decide. And I'm of the belief as well, too. Like, you know, people should think more about like what they believe and like make those decisions for themselves rather than just be like, OK, well, I was told to believe this because a lot of us are programmed. So it seems like a place where there's a, there's more freedom. It doesn't seem like some sort of like programming or something <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah that's the goal right like yeah no dogma just yeah very lightly moderated the only real rules are be open-minded and be kind that's about yeah, it yeah yeah that's about it yeah and i love that um yeah. speaking of you know spirituality and just like having a community that really helps um other people i know that you like to distinguish between spirituality uh, science, philosophy, religion, and self-help. Even though they, a lot of these things bleed into each other, I just have to hear your thoughts, especially on what you think the difference is between spirituality and like religion and also philosophy. Yeah, I think that they're, I think they're all saying almost the same thing again. Like even, cause like, I think all religions are saying very similar things, but I also think philosophers scientists, spiritualists, philosophers, they're all, we're all really, as I, I've read, I, I had the, when I had my, my kind of awakening moment, I wasn't on a spiritual journey really that I knew of. I mean, I was, but I didn't know it. Right. So I didn't really know the vocabulary or like I hadn't studied a lot of philosophy. I hadn't studied a lot of religion. So I had to read a lot. And so as I'm reading, I think I read 60 books in four months, uh, went crazy. I was reading like 12, 13, 14 hours a day. Um, taking notes furiously, writing stuff down. I was just struck by, and I would switch between philosophy and then read a book on a science that was also a scientist who was a philosopher, a scientist who wrote about religion or, you know, people who wrote about Hinduism or Buddhism or, or the Abrahamic faith and Christianity and, and the mystics. And I can't find a difference, you know, whether it's, whether I'm reading about Christianity or I'm reading like the philosophy of physics by Max Planck who was the father of quantum physics, he said, basically, you know, science can't get behind consciousness. We know it exists. Everything we see postulates its existence. We even believe that matter sits on top of consciousness, but we can't prove it. 
but maybe philosophy can, maybe religion can, maybe spirituality can. So I think when you get the father of quantum physics saying something like that, like, you know, it's all the same thing, you know? I feel like it's all the same thing, but, um, you know, because human beings were so diverse and people learn and absorb yeah, knowledge exactly. differently. So it's kind of right. like finding different ways to say the same thing, right? Like yes. even when we talk about yes. matter and gravity and all that stuff, I think in the spiritual community, we could like, that might be synonymous to like when people are talking about like energy and how everything is energy and, you know, yeah. um, like, yeah, they're, they're just, and when, you know, within the science community as well, there's like energy can neither, neither be destroyed or created. And then we kind of go back to like, want oneness like e eternity and like just the like just how the world is and how like it's it goes on for eternity like it can't be uh destroyed at least right not that we know of so it's kind right. of like we're all kind of saying the same things and um but just like in different ways which is which is so fascinating and sometimes i wish people would like wake up to the idea that you know, we're all saying the same thing, but I feel like there's a lot of, you know, confusion. There's a lot of, no, this has to be, you know, there has to be one truth, right? And it's like, yeah. we all have a piece to the puzzle, right? Like, why don't we yes. like come together and like build out this like whole picture? But I think a lot of people are very much like, this is the truth. This is the, this is the only reality. But the truth is we're all living in our own reality and we all can we all have limited um vision unfortunately so yeah yes yeah and i i, I you you nailed it 100 percent there and it if you look at the great teachers whether it's jesus christ or buddha or lousy how many times did we see them say the same thing in 20 different ways because they knew that they didn't they didn't know which which thing they said would resonate with someone yeah. so even within the the specific religions they say things a bunch of different ways, hoping that someone will. And, and humans are very tribalistic. And I think we, it's okay. I think we have to accept that and say, this tribe over here says I'm right. And this tribe over here says I'm right. You know, well, it's okay. I mean, that's that's how humans are. It's just, a, it's trying to get people to understand it's okay to have different tribes. It's okay to believe, like you said, different things in different ways. So whatever works for you, that's great. Just don't, don't expect me, <laughs> me to exactly agree with you because that seems unreasonable right yeah it seems unreasonable and and don't feel like you know we are tribalistic and i think it's within us to feel like our tribe is the best tribe right yeah, exactly yeah. <laughs> and yeah, my team like, right it's all, this it's all is my, my team right yeah exactly but i think you know i can be like yeah this is my team and i i might think we're the best but i don't have to necessarily put you down or make you feel like you know what you believe is you know, completely left field. I mean, there are some things that I I just can't get behind personally. I mean, everybody's like different. So for me, um, I struggle with the flat earth theory, for example. But <laughs> yeah, same. Um, for me, I've had to tell myself like, man, like I agree with 90, you know, my neighbor and I probably agree on 90% of things. We want to be happy, healthy, and have security. Of our, and I, I, so I have to tell myself that 10% that we disagree on, I just kind of, I got to let go of that because otherwise I'll just, I'll just be so frustrated, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. The things that we are, agree on, cool. The other stuff, it's like, yeah, it's going to have to, you know, release that. Um, yeah, for so, sure. So, yeah, <laughs> I agree with you on that. And, you know, so what I was also going to ask too, you know, within the spiritual community and stuff, people always talk about this shift into like a five dimensional reality, which kind of talks a little bit more about like right now we're talking about duality, right? Like this is my camp versus your camp. But like the 5D notion kind of talks about understanding how everybody kind of plays a role. And like, even though people are different, there's still a oneness. So do you buy into... Or do you believe in these like dimensional shifts and like evolution and all that stuff? Do you do you talk about those things or do you believe in them? I, I definitely believe in like the multiverse that 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 there's multiple realities that our universe that we live in is not just the universe. It's, it is a universe of universes and that there are different places. Because I, I don't like I think that this thing that you and I see right now, 
like the computers that we're looking into, the camera, the microphone, these walls that are around us in our room. I don't think any of that's real. I, I you know, I, I don't necessarily see it as a matrix sort of thing necessarily. I just think that our individual consciousness that is tied to the universal oneness creates our individual reality. So I believe that this reality that I'm in is kind of my my bubble of consciousness. And that creates my reality, which bumps into all these other bubbles of reality from everybody else's consciousness, but still part of the collective. And that's what creates this like concrete world that we see and, and move through. That's such an interesting way of putting it, because I love the idea of the multiverse theory, just from like a very nerd perspective and very much yeah. down a rabbit hole with like Marvel and all that yeah. stuff. Right. So I love the idea of you know, the multiverse um, theory, because again, and I think it also makes sense because when you talk to psychics or people who like have the ability to predict the future or talk about the future, they say that like the future is a moving target, right? So it also makes me think if the future is a moving target, that means that there are different potential futures like happening all at once, right? So it's kind of like, depending on the decision that you make determines what reality you enter. But like to your point about the different bubbles like the different realities that we're living in I agree with that you know I, when I was younger I used to have this image of like everyone had like an earth over their head <laughs> but everyone's earth was different like everyone was literally in their own world I don't know why I used to have that like imagery come like image come to my mind but it sounds so similar to like what you're talking about right it's kind of always looking around and being like how much of this is real and how much of this is like a projection of like my reality, which is so trippy to think about because <laughs> it's like an infinite, like unending no, it, cycle. It, yeah, absolutely. Um, and for me, sometimes I'm just like, again, it's like people always say source wants to experience itself. That's why we're having these like experiences. But it's again, it's just so trippy to think about, like you said at the beginning, um, but you were referring to the government, obviously, is this notion of like organized chaos. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it <laughs> that, is. That comes to mind, which is, again, yeah. just so uh, trippy. And somebody else also said something. They're like, are we dreaming while we're awake, but we think we're actually living in the real world? And are our dreams actually like reality right but when we wake up we think we're awake but we're actually dreaming another yeah thing that i mean kind of blew my how mind. do we know how would you know right yeah like i think that's a perfectly that's a perfectly valid question yeah exactly yeah it, it's just also it's it's just so also interesting to me that's why it, it it helps me not to take myself too seriously and take life too seriously even though life is can be very serious but it's just like it's almost kind of like we're in a video game, right? Maybe not a Matrix in the way we think about Matrix, like the movie and stuff like that. But it just feels like some sort of like game that we're all in. But <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, yeah. It, that goes all the way back to was it Plato or Aristotle and the the allegory of the cave where the mm -hmm. guys are in the cave and it's dark and there's a shadow. They, they thought they were their shadows, right? Yes, and then they they leave the cave and walk out in the sunlight years later, and they realize that they're human, like they're, they're people. Yeah. But before that, they were just shadows on the cave wall or whatever. Like I don't, I'm not probably not describing. It very no, well, I think you're. But, no, I think you're spot on. Yeah. But I mean, this goes back all the way to the the you know, the the original Greek philosophers and and what is reality. Yeah, yeah, I love Plato. Plato's allegory. I think it was Plato. It, um, I think it was Plato. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And I just remember, like, I had to read that uh, story a couple of times and I, before I, it actually, like, really stuck what he was saying. Same. And I Same. think the person who left the cave and came back and was like, hey, guys, like, there's this, like, we're stuck in this cave, but there's so much more out there, right? I think I'm, I might be getting this wrong. Um. But I think the other people in the cave were just like outraged and like yeah. were yes. super violent and like what are you talking about? It just it yeah. was like the it the idea of their reality potentially being a lie or just not the full reality yes. was just so unnerving to them. So unnerving. So yeah, absolutely. it makes you think like when you have conversations like this, even though I do think now people don't think these conversations are as crazy anymore <laughs> right but i think that 
you know, for a while. And there are still a lot of people out there that are just kind of like, you know, nah. what are you talking about? <laughs> nah, this this isn't it. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on heaven and hell? I don't believe in hell. I, I think mm. that the only way someone goes to hell is if they believe in it. <laughs> so, I've heard that before. So I, I think that, yeah, people can go to hell uh, if they if they 100 percent on Earth believe that there is a hell and that they do bad things, and they go to hell. There's a very good chance they may go to hell. And I, I find that tragic. Wow. <laughs> so I don't mean to laugh. I don't, I'm not trying to, <laughs> to be a jerk. But, yeah, I know. But no, I don't I don't I don't really believe I think heaven I think heaven is achieving enlightenment or nirvana or the the divine state of Christ consciousness. I I, I subscribe de deeply to the the Christian mystics and Christ consciousness or the specific red letters of the New Testament that are you know what Jesus said versus what all the other stuff. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I I, I don't particularly believe in either one. Uh. Although if you believe in one enough, one or the other, then it probably does exist in your in your reality. That's, Maybe even yeah. in your after reality. Yeah, I've heard that before because again, going back to the idea of like we create our own reality, then I guess if you if you you know, and most reality comes starts with thought, right? Like we live in a very mental universe. The the universe is mental according to like hermetic philosophy. So it's like if you are having these thoughts, then you are creating that reality. Reality becomes like a self fulfilling prophecy. So I have heard that notion before and it's it's a little scary to think about right <laughs> like oh my god if i think about this you know hard enough then i might find myself there yeah yeah i listen to a lot of like near-death right. experiences and i've heard most people say that they've only been to heaven or you know experienced a light centered um near death experience but others have had like really scary like experiences where they felt like they were in hell realms my my stepfather in law um had he died uh, but he he came back and mm -hmm. in the hospital and he said that he had fought off a dark being while he was and he had gone to the light or whatever but he had uh, fought off his dark being mm -hmm. um I always thought that was interesting that that he had a struggle and came out in the light and uh and he came wow. back to tell about it wow um, so that's that's only like firsthand. Indie, I have experience with, but I think studying Indies is really interesting from a metaphysical perspective and also from a consciousness scientific perspective too. Yeah. It's interesting. You mentioned the dark beings. Like I've heard so many people talk about low vibrational beings and like demons and like lower astral entities, like attacking them. And sometimes I don't think all, but sometimes I just get this idea or this like notion that sometimes those like lower vibrational beings that we might be attacking, whether in a dream or if somebody like, you know, goes to the other side really quickly, it might be like the, the darker, more wounded parts of us that we are, we have not yet healed. So right. almost kind of like fighting them in the spiritual sense um, or in the metaphysical sense is almost kind of like a shedding or a reckoning with the darker, more shadowy sides of our personalities and who we are as people. I fully subscribe to that. I think that's mm -hmm. a great way to explain it because I think that struggle within ourself is this big thing. I, I, I very much in kind of in line with that. I see us as the balance of the universe walking and we can, we see the light on the right and the dark on the left and or vice versa or whatever. But we're that balance walking in the middle and we get to choose where we put our attention. Mm -hmm. but we still have to accept the darkness. We can't ignore it. We can't pretend it doesn't exist, you know? And there's, so there's that, that acceptance of balance. So I, I, I definitely subscribe to kind of that idea. When people say accept the darkness, I feel like sometimes I think I have a sense of what you mean, but I want to fully understand. So how do we accept the darkness without it consuming us? So yeah. cause like some stuff are like some of some of some stuff is really dark, right? Like oh, really, really, dark. really yeah. dark. So what do you mean by like accept the darkness? Like how would you what meaning do you subscribe to that? So yeah, that's a that's a good question. It's a good topic. So I was so for me, like I was I have like I accepted that I have darkness within me because I, I did these dark things in the military, right? Like mm -hmm. I dropped bombs on people and sent people to go capture people and broke up families and tribes and awful stuff, stuff that I wish I hadn't done. 
that's dark stuff. And then, and then we have, sometimes we have dark thoughts that we don't want to admit that we have. And so I think that as a society, we don't really accept that there's darkness within us. There's that, that, that darkness is a, is a necessary part of the universe. I think we get it all jaded in Judeo-Christian society because we just talk about the light and heaven and goodness. And then we just subscribe everything else to kind of this hellish type thing, right? Um, or bad. And and darkness can be bad. That's, I'm not saying it's not. I just, it's just that there's probably darkness in each of us. And maybe, it, maybe it's just me or maybe it's just a few people. I don't know. But, but uh, I think we've all, we all have these feelings and thoughts that, that come forward and that we, we push back and say, oh, that's not me. That's a, that's this thought over here that I just was a fleeting thought or whatever. But I think if we accept that the darkness is there and we say, I accept it, but I don't let it control me, that's what we have to do. It's an acceptance in a way of saying, I know it's there and I maybe I'm uncomfortable with it at first, but I'm just going to become comfortable with it, not comfortable with it in a way where it defines me, it controls me, but it's like the yin and the yang, right? Of Taoism. So you've got the, the, you know, the, the, the light and the dark and they're in balance with each other. I think that's it. I think that's why I like Taoism so much because that line in the middle is the Tao. That is the way. That is the universe. That is the that's God, the divine nature. Uh, and if you look at nature, nature is balance. Nature is light and dark. There's birth and rebirth, and and there's death, and all of that. And there's it's a cycle, right? So for me, that's how I would describe it. I'd say acceptance is not an acceptance in an overwhelming sense. It's just acceptance that I'm not, I'm going to know that is there. I'm going to accept that it's there, but I'm not going to let it define me or control me. Mm, I like that. I do like that. It's kind of, we can't a hundred percent get rid of the darkness, right? Cause like you right. said, the, what I understand the need for darkness in this world, in this reality, in, in, in just nature, et cetera, is without the dark, you can't recognize the light the significance yes. of the light yeah light loses its significance without the dark right 100 percent. it's about free will yeah. it's about choice and i you know i i i i like i like that you bring that up because people ask well why is there pain and suffering in the world if there's a divine if there's a god or whatever it's like you know that's not the point like do you like free will and most almost everyone will tell you well yeah i like free will i like i like having choices i like being i like the idea that i have free choice and free will so well if you like free will and if you like choice you have to accept that <laughs> there, there is light and dark out there on either side of those choices and and that somewhere in between them is some balance and so yeah i the contrast of the light against the dark i think is a hugely important theme yeah and you know i was thinking about it the other day like Again, we, we live in a world where it's kind of like good or bad, black or white. Um, but, you know, when yes. we think about the dark versus the light, there's really no like hard line in the middle that separates the dark from the, um, the, the light. They kind of bleed into each other. It's kind of how they say like love and hate are two sides of the same coin, right? Like the, yeah. the, 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 the coin has two different sides, but it's, they're both yes it's still one coin right like yeah. there's no separation between the dark side of the coin or the light side of the coin it kind of like all bleeds together so i think a lot of it is is gray and that gray part is like the the freedom of choice that you're talking about and the ability to to recognize the light and i kind of want to you know dig deeper a little bit into your experience if you don't mind sharing like you know, while, you know, being in the army, there's some things like you said that you regretted. So did those like what you might consider dark decisions haunt you for a while? How were you able to like release them or like come to terms with, okay, these were decisions that I, I made at the time that I thought were the best decisions or I had to make versus like who I am now? No, that's a, that's a powerful question. Yeah, it, it bothered me for a long time. And there's a part of me that I've tried to accept and let go of that it probably will still bother me for a long time, even if I've kind of accepted it. Um, yeah, it bothered me for a long time. I, I I realized that 
I did a lot of things that saved people's lives. I kept my brothers and sisters in arms in my unit alive. People, when I was at Kandahar Airfield, it was the sing single busiest runway on planet Earth. It had 50,000 people on base. Like I was in my, my unit, our unit was responsible for protecting that base. All those people and all those aircraft and all this stuff. So it was a big job. And and so, yeah, I, I, I know I saved lives. I know I kept my people alive by making good decisions. And I know, you know, down to a fairly specific number, how many people that I, you know, I recommended to my commander to drop the bomb or to fire the missile or to, you know, and how many people that we went and captured and sent to prison and took them away from their wife and their children. And then, and they, you know, in Afghanistan, that's their whole, that's the patriarchy. It's like, that's the whole, that's their whole world in a place like Afghanistan, the, the husband. Um, and we would send those people to prison and their, the family would be, broken so yeah that that tore at me the longer i did it and you know there were some times where some things happened as i was conducting operations because i was kind of a i was an intel director and i also was an operations manager for an asymmetric warfare unit um and yeah it, it definitely wore on me um and it's it's something that i've been able to come to terms with and it's one of the reasons i want to give back to the world and get back give back to the light of the universe because I don't think that any one thing that we did or any series of things that we did defines who we are. Um, so I think that it's, I think one of the most powerful things in humanity and you can see it in, in most literature and movies and it was redemption, right? There's great redemption out there. So I want everyone out there that thinks that they're not good enough or they've done bad things or the, the all this stuff, there's always room for redemption. I 100% agree with you that absolutely redemption is possible. It's painful. It's it's messy. It, there's a lot of like emotions that come with it. And like you said, there's probably going to be a part of you that always feels like, you know, regret or just like, I, I wish I didn't do those things. Right. But I I love that you are kind of taking that moment and, and looking at your future and looking at your present and thinking, OK, how can I you know, continue to make the world a better place and kind of like, you know, you can't reverse your actions from the past, but you can make sure that your actions moving forward are on the side of kind of like more love, more loving and, and more light, I, I would say. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you. Yeah. I, I that's, a, that's a great perspective and I, I appreciate that. Yeah. I have to ask John before we close, has there been anything that you've shifted in perspective lately? It could be as lighthearted as you want it to be or as deep as you want it to be. You know, I I always call myself a, a teacher and a student. And I love when I'm a student as well. I, I think it's a good thing. I, I'm trying to be more myself out amongst everybody else, you know, like be my more authentic self. I, I, I know I live that way a lot, but I need to do it more. And I have been doing that more. And, and I find good things happen when that happens. And so I've really appreciated that recently, that shift. Thank you for sharing that. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you via your community or just like, you know, follow you on social media? Sure. Our main website is kishar.org. It's K-I-S-H-A-R.org. That's our, our main page that they can join our community. They can seek out individual uh, spiritual guides and coaching sessions. Our social media is mostly uh, at Kishar Spiritual on most platforms. And we have a pretty cool YouTube channel uh, called Peace on Your Journey. And there's links to that on our website as well. But check it out. It's It's got helpful information for people to just kind of be more chill. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm going to put that in the show notes as well. Thank you, John, for stopping by Shifting Dimensions. This, thank you so much. It's been great. You're a great host.